Yes, my name is Marshall Coles. I'm a born-again Christ follower, and that will define me more than anything that I say here today. Uh, <clears throat> this is my wife, LaShawn. We've been married just about two years now. Uh, we dated all through high school, so we've known each other for a very long time. Uh, once we got married, uh, a little bit later we bought a house and we live in Litchfield now. If you were to take a map of Nebraska, if you don't know where Litchfield is, and put a, a pin tack in Grand Island and a pin in Broken Bow, Highway 2 that connects it, we're right in the middle of that, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <clears throat> I've always felt called to uh, ministry work, as we all are as Christians. Uh, I've always felt that calling. I've also always been very passionate about working with youth and young kids. Uh, so that's where Homer Trail came into play. Uh, it was back in uh, November, December of this last year that I quit my full-time job as a mechanic, uh, working, getting steady income, uh, benefits, health care, retirement plan, all that. I quit and I started working at Homer Trail <clears throat> with no benefits, no guaranteed pay or anything like that, just trusting that the Lord's going to take care of us, which He has taken care of us. So I'm going to share a little bit about, the, about camp, a little bit about the work that I've been doing, and then I'm going to have just a kind of a traditional message to share with you all that uh, I think we can all get something out of. Uh, if you don't know, Homer Trail is in Mason City, Nebraska, which again on that map between Grand Island and Loop City, or Grand Island and Broken Bow, uh, just 10 miles north of Litchfield, or west of Litchfield, uh, and it's just off a little ways. <clears throat> it is surrounded by a big bluff on one side and a creek bottom on the other side. So it's kind of isolated out in the middle of nowhere, um, which kind of gives a unique, uh, kind of secluded feel to it. You know, there's a lot of things going on in this world to distract us from the Lord, and Homer Trail is a good place to get away from that, to get kids out and to have a focused time on what the camp uh, aims to do. And what is the camp's goal? Uh, Homer Trail is a non-denominational Bible camps. We just open the Word of God and that's what we teach from. Uh, and that is the number one goal is to share the gospel and proclaim what Christ has done for us. <clears throat> There's a lot of activities that we do there just to get uh, the kids involved and excited about being there. Uh, just a few of them. We have an awesome sand volleyball pit that kids love to play at. Uh, we have a pretty awesome paintball course as well. Uh, the funny thing about the way paintball games start is you got two teams on either end and they start off great big team of players and they all start running for the barricades and by the time they get to the first barricade, half of them are already out. <laughs> <laughs> That's just kind of the way almost every game starts, but it is always a lot of fun. <clears throat> um, we have a great big ball field. Uh, recently we bought a whole bunch of kayaks. Uh, so they're just fun things for kids to get excited about. Uh, there's also a huge slip and slide. That's uh, kind of just, <clears throat> as you look at it more, it starts to become kind of a scary looking, but the kids enjoy it and they love going down it. Um, <clears throat> anyway, there's lots of fun activities, but still the number one goal of the camp is to proclaim Christ to these kids. So a lot of these activities, they're fun to do, but that's just to uh, keep them excited about coming back, but with the main goal of sharing Christ with everyone that comes there. <clears throat> uh, since I've started there, uh, they started a new project, a new boys' dorm. Uh, the dorm itself will hold somewhere between 50 to 60 kids, so it's going to be uh, pretty awesome when it's done. Uh, it's been in the works for almost two and a half or three years now. Uh, <clears throat> the reason it takes so long is because you kind of have a limited window when you're able to work on it um, and when campers are there and 
and then when the snow comes and whatnot. So, but it is on schedule to be done uh, by this summer. Hopefully, uh, sometime by May, it'll be completed. It's a two-story building. Uh, the top and bottom floors are basically identical uh, with a few uh, uh, uniqueness. Uh, the bottom floor is a little bit more handicap accessible. There's a couple bunks that are a little bit wider. So if someone had a wheelchair, they would be able to fit in there easily. Uh, there's also the bathrooms downstairs, two uh, a toilet area and a, a showering area are wider. So that <clears throat> is more handicap accessible. Uh, Right now, where the dorm is, the outside is completely sealed up, all the siding's on. This is a little bit of an older picture, but the doors are on, the inside is insulated and drywalled, and there's heat inside. Uh, there's a man that's laying some tile work in the base, or in the bathrooms, and uh, once he gets done, we'll be able to start uh, painting and building bunk beds and lay the carpet in there and it'll be ready to be used. So the Lord has really blessed uh, the efforts that we put into that. And uh, that's mainly what I've been working on since I've been there. Uh, <clears throat> and I could talk about the camp all day, but I was asked to uh, maybe share a kind of a traditional message as well. So. I'd love to talk to you guys more about the camp, what's going on, uh, what I'll be doing there. But if you want to turn in your Bibles or open your apps uh, to Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17, this is going to be the feeding of the 5,000. I'm uh, not going to lie, I have given this message once, once before, so this will be my second attempt at it or run at it. I think it's a good, good message, good thing that we can get out of it. Um, this was taken from a series that our church is doing right now called uh, The Journey to the Cross, where we've been going through the book of Luke uh, leading up to the events of the cross and Easter, and this is where uh, I was to share on. So, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, read through the story. I want to kind of pick it apart and what I think was going on there. And then we're going to have an application there at the end. So, if uh, you turn to Luke 9, starting in verse 10. I'm going to read through this story. <clears throat> it says, When the apostles returned... They reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them, <clears throat> took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned about it, they followed him. He welcomed them, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding village and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. Verse 13, He replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We only have five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all of the crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But He said to the disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did this, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. Let's pray really quick. <clears throat> God, would come before you, I pray that you will humble myself, humble the people here, knowing that you alone are God, and it's through you that we have life. God, I pray that you'll bless the words that I speak today. Uh, let them be from you. If there's anything that I say here that is not from you, Lord, let the people not hear it, not perceive it, not remember it. Again, I just pray that you'll bless the rest of this uh, time of worship that we have here. 
We ask this in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so, it starts off, it says that the disciples returned and reported to him. Where'd they return from? <clears throat> well, if you look back at the beginning of chapter 9, it says they returned uh, from a sort of a missions trip. It says that they were to... Jesus sent them out, and they weren't to take any food or any, clo uh, any extra clothes or any money or anything. So it's this almost uh, high-intensity missions trip, if you will. They're to go door-to-door -to, -door to people and to share about the kingdom of God. And Jesus even told them that if someone doesn't welcome you, don't, uh, don't get upset about it. Shake the dust off your feet and go to the next. Okay, so the disciples are on... I'm going to refer to it as a missions trip. They are on this trip where they were going door to door, lots of people, lots of uh, witnessing and telling about what they had done. <clears throat> and it says that after they returned and reported, they were tired. If any of you have ever been on a missions trip before, uh, whatever it may be, maybe it was just volunteering for a day somewhere or Maybe you went uh, to a whole different place to help people. Or maybe even if you haven't, just a, a hard day of work with other people. It can be exhausting. It can be mentally and physically tolling on yourself. For me personally, uh, <clears throat> the missions trips that I've been on or the uh, weeks of camp that I've served at, I can keep a good positive attitude of... The goal we are here for is to share the gospel or to help these people. But after a week of that, <clears throat> you get tired. And when you get home, you need some rest. You need to find rest, whatever that may be. If it's taking a nap or going to a place that has Wi-Fi and just peaching out for a while, whatever it is, <clears throat> you need to find rest afterward. And Jesus recognized this. He says that he, he takes them to Bethsaida, which is uh, just a small town. I don't know if they made it there or not, but it's just a place that's secluded to find rest, which is what the disciples wanted and what they needed. <clears throat> and, uh, but then it says that the crowds recognized where they were going and they started following, following them. Uh, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark, the correlating story describes this part as the uh, people coming to him, they were like sheep without a shepherd. So you get this picture of Jesus, maybe they got into a boat with the disciples because they seemed to do that a lot. And they started to uh, go off to this Bethsaida, to this secluded place. And the people see it and they are all starting to run after him. They are like sheep without a shepherd. They are people that need the shepherd. <clears throat> and Jesus also recognizes this, and he welcomes the people. One other interesting note that uh, someone pointed out to me was that when the disciples returned to Jesus and reported uh, back from this missions trip, this very well could have been the moment that uh, Jesus was told that John the Baptist had been killed, who was a good friend so Jesus also is probably in, in mourning at this point with the loss. But even with that, Jesus recognizes that these people that are coming to him need the shepherd as well. <clears throat> so we get a picture of the characteristics of Jesus, that he is compassionate and graceful to welcome those who need him. So to kind of sum up, I'm going to do this a couple times, to sum up the picture of where we're at, the disciples returned, they're tired, they need rest, so they're heading to get rest, and more people start showing up. And Jesus welcomes them and starts teaching to them. Verses 12 to 14. <clears throat> Once Jesus is teaching the crowds of people that are there. It says that the disciples came to him and they said to send the crowds away. 
And why did they say that? Why did they say to send the crowds away? <clears throat> it's recorded that uh, they said send them away because there's no food here. They need to go find a place to sleep for the night. They're in a remote, remote place. Or these are all legitimate concerns. It's kind of left in my mind if maybe that was only half the reason they said to send them away. Maybe they, again, were just tired and they thought they were a little bit better than the other people there and they wanted time with Jesus. Whatever the case may be, Jesus tells them something profound that spoke to me and should speak to you guys. He says, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. If you are concerned about their well-being, you give them something to eat. <clears throat> it's recorded that there were 5,000 men there. I'm sure you've heard this before, but at that uh, time in, in history, the way they recorded people was just by counting the men. <clears throat> There's some biblical authors that estimate there very easily could have been 20,000 people there. It's a number I'm going to refer to, but nevertheless, there were, were 5,000 men plus children and, and wives and women. <clears throat> a lot of people also estimate that this very well could have been the largest crowd of people that had ever been uh, present for a teaching from Jesus. Something that I thought was kind of interesting about that is you have this huge crowd of people. You'd probably want to tell them something important, but the only thing that we have from this story is the feeding of the 5,000. There's nothing actually told about what Jesus taught there. So it says something to the importance of this story. <clears throat> so there easily could have been 20,000 people there that Jesus told the disciples to feed. And let's be honest, this is an, an impossible task. Okay, there's no way that they could feed these people with just five loaves of bread and, and two pieces of fish. It's an impossible task that Jesus has commanded them with. The story concludes... Verses 15 and 17. The, uh, <clears throat> again, to sum up what's going on, the disciples are tired. They have been... Uh, and now it's getting late, and they've been given this impossible task to feed possibly 20,000 people. And all they have is maybe enough food for one or two people. So, how does it conclude? Jesus tells the disciples to have the group sit in groups of about 50. <clears throat> now, I don't know how many of you have ever worked with people, but if you have a large group of people, even if it were just 5,000 people, trying to organize them into groups of 50 would be a difficult task in and of itself. You know, you come to a group and you can get the picture of maybe Peter leading the leading it. He's saying, "All right, you guys, you all sit in your own in a group here." The person's asking, him, "Why? What are we doing?" Oh, Jesus! Jesus said to sit in groups, so that's what we're going to do. Or, oh, well, are we going to get anything to eat? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus is working on that too. <clears throat> and whatever, go to the next group. You guys sit in groups of fifty or and whatnot. And well, why are we doing that? Just do it, okay? You know. <clears throat> Having groups of 50, that alone would be a very difficult task because everybody wants to know what's going on and whatnot. So <clears throat> that alone could have easily added a lot of uh, anxiety onto the disciples. What does Jesus then do? It says that he lifts the bread up to heaven, and he blesses it. He thanks God for the food that he has been provided with. He thanks God for what they've been given. Even though it doesn't look like there's anything there, there's just a few 
pieces of bread and some fish. But nevertheless, Jesus raises it up and he blesses it. He thanks God for what he has provided. <clears throat> it is then said that he takes the bread and he breaks it. So Jesus gets done praying over the food and thanking God for what he's provided. And he takes the bread and he, he breaks it. He starts tearing it up. And again, I can see him handing it to Peter. And now Peter has this handful of bread. And Peter's like, you know, just because you tore up the bread doesn't mean we have any more. You know, Jesus says, go feed them. So Peter takes the food to the first group, maybe hands some out, gets to the last person that he has food for and looks at the guy beside him and says, well, I'm sorry, that's all I got. And he goes back to Jesus. And again, Jesus takes that bread and he breaks it. And he gives it to Peter again. And every time that Peter comes back, Jesus gives him just a little bit more. Gives him just a little bit more each time. Until the disciples had fed the crowd. Every time they came back to Jesus, He gave them a little bit more. It wasn't enough to feed all of them at once, but every time they came back to Him, they gave Him just a little bit more. And so at the end of the story, the disciples had completed that task that Jesus gave them, even though it was impossible. Through Jesus, they were able to feed all those people with nothing more than that little bit of bread and that little bit of fish. <clears throat> it says that there were 12 baskets of food left over, meaning every person in that crowd that was there was able to eat. And not only eat, it says that they were satisfied, meaning they ate as much as they wanted. And the only reason someone that that crowd would not have been full is if they chose not to eat. If they chose not to eat, that's the only way that they would not have been fed because there was enough left over. <clears throat> so how can we apply this to our lives today? might be a little bit personal and whatnot, but this can apply to myself as well. All of these areas, you could say, <clears throat> as a church, we don't have the budget to do this right now. There's just not enough there. Or as an individual, I know we're supposed to be giving, but there's just not enough there right now. It's impossible for us to do that. I know these people need help, but there's just not enough time. Our schedule is too busy, and we can't do it let alone sharing the gospel with other people. I'm not good at talking. They would probably just laugh at me. It's not going to work. It's, it's impossible. I can't do it. But we need to be like the disciples. We need to bring what we have before the Lord, and He can bless it and use it. And it may not be all that you think it should be. It may not be all that's needed all at once. But just like that food wasn't all that was needed, if we bring it before the Lord and He blesses it, He's going to give us a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more until that task, that impossible task that He has given us has been completed. You might think, I don't have enough time in my schedule to go and help this person. Well, if you have a little bit of time and the Lord has put it on your heart to help them, you bring that time before Him, He'll give you a little bit more, a little bit more, until that task that you said was impossible has been completed through the Lord. <clears throat> I told you this was a, a uh, message that I had given before from a series called Journey to the Cross. 
And uh, the very first message that we had in this series asked this other profound question. It asked, how does this point to the cross? How does this point to the cross? The first message that was given in this series was um, when Jesus was, excuse me, left or forgot at the temple or stayed behind. And he said uh, the way it pointed to the cross was that they were celebrating the old covenant. And Jesus was at the temple as the lamb to represent the new covenant. And that was the way it pointed to the cross. So how does this story point us to the cross? How does this story point us to the cross? Maybe it wasn't directly meant to point us to the cross. <clears throat> but a uh, similarity that I found was just as that broken bread was enough to feed every person there and so many more, so is Jesus' body, His broken body, and shed blood was enough to cover the sins of everyone here and of all people of all time. And just like how there was so much left over, and the only reason someone wouldn't have been full is if they chose not to eat, that's the same way it is with Jesus' grace. The only way that His broken body will not cover your sins or my sins is if I or you choose not to let them Let's pray. God, I thank you for this opportunity to come here to uh, St. Paul, to, to Grace Baptist, and to share your word and the work that's being done at the camp. God, I pray that you will bless this church, bless the, the people of this church that make it up. God, again, I just thank you for your son, for what he has done for us on that cross. And I thank you so much for that. Again, we pray your blessing over the rest of this service. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.